brings the announcements, and then, yeah. Welcome, GI Joes and Janes. I am Flint Whitlock from the Veterans Museum in Broomfield. I'm going to be your MC for today. Uh, it's a fascinating program about women's roles in World War II, and it will be presented by two local World War II historians and actresses. I want to thank, uh, first of all, the city and county of Broomfield for all the support that they give the museum and for the use of the auditorium here today. And I see that you're all properly socially distanced out there. Today's program is uh, a coffee and conversation program that we usually have at the museum, but uh, because of our stage presentation today, we thought it would uh, work best here in the auditorium. And so uh, those in the auditorium, if you have a cell phone, you might check and make sure that it's turned off. The uh, program today is also sponsored, as I mentioned, by the Veterans Museum of Broomfield, of which I am a volunteer. Our mission at the museum is not to glorify war, but to honor all the brave Colorado men and women who have served and sacrificed for our country. But before we get started, I'd like to give a little uh, commercial message for the museum, for those of you who may not uh, have ever been to the museum, or maybe you've not been there recently. So uh, let's start with our show. If we can have our first slide up. There we go, this is the museum that's located on Midway, a few blocks east of Wadsworth. It is the uh, former Mamie Dowd Eisenhower Library before the Sydney and County Broomfield built this new one. And uh, so it's got a, little, a lot of historical value. Uh, we see a shot here of Mamie uh, during the dedication in 1963 uh, she was giving a few remarks, and uh, her husband, Ike, who was the uh, former president, I don't know that I've got a, there we go, Ike is right here, he's looking on, and apparently she has said something very amusing, because the people are, uh, are laughing uh, at what she had said. So let's take a brief tour of the museum, uh, because it was a former library, we thought it fitting that we have a library of our own there. And it's a, a large library. We have approximately 2,000 books uh, on the themes of military history, political history, things of that sort, plus an extensive library of DVDs as well. You're clicking escape. Oh, okay. There we go. There's the library. Uh, we also have every two weeks uh, a coffee and conversation program and presentation where historians, uh, veterans, people with a story to tell about the history of, of our country and its military heritage who come in and make the presentation. How many, Mike, how many presentations have we done there so far? There have been 185 presentations uh, over the past few years, and we have, I think, most of those uh, archived. So if you wanted to see a particular person's presentation, uh, you can uh, request that. We have educational programs. We like to get school groups in and other civic groups to come in and learn about the, the history that they don't learn in, in school. Uh, and our history that we portray at the museum goes back all the way to the Civil War. A lot of people don't even realize that Colorado was involved in the Civil War, and yet we were. Uh, we prevented a Texas invasion coming up uh, through New Mexico, and we fought them off at the Battle of Glorieta Pass. And uh, it, they, they had to wait, the Texans had to wait until uh, we had ski areas here before they returned. Uh, we have an exhibit on frontier life, the forts and the settlements that were uh, built in Colorado after the Civil War. Uh, we talk about Colorado's role in the Spanish-American War where 
a regiment from Colorado actually captured the city of Manila and uh, brought a quick end to the war. We have a display on World War I, World War II, this is the European theater room, um, showing two famous units that were connected to Colorado, the 157th Infantry Regiment, which was the part of the uh, Colorado National Guard and became part of the 45th Infantry Division, and the 10th Mountain Division, the ski soldiers who trained here. We have an exhibit on aviation in World War II, and all of these exhibits wrap into them the personal stories of men and women from Colorado who took part in these uh, battles and operations uh, because our focus is on the veteran. That's why it's the first word in our name. Uh, we have uh, our Pacific War Theater with exhibit on Pearl Harbor. We had people from Colorado who were at Pearl Harbor when uh, it was attacked by the Japanese. Some, a couple of ships, the USS Colorado and the USS Denver, who were named for um, cities here in the state. Uh, Marines, naval uh, officers and enlisted men, and uh, also uh, aviators in the Pacific are featured. We have a, a ro whole room dedicated to women from Colorado who served in the armed forces. And we have a room dedicated to the home front because we could not have won the war without the 100% support of people back home. Another view of our home front room. We have hands-on areas so that when kids come to, this, to the museum, they can try on various uniforms, maybe get their picture taken by mom and dad or their, their teacher, and it gives them kind of a personal connection to what's going on. After World War II, we went into the Cold War, and we have a, a room dedicated to the Cold War that talks about how it started, the significant events, and how it ended. Uh, here you see a haz hazardous uh, material suit from the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Uh, one of our uh, past presidents, Lou Moyer, was a B-52 pilot during the Cold War in, in Vietnam. We also have a fully outfitted fallout shelter uh, from the 1950s that you will find, I think, quite fascinating when you, when you visit. And even a, a desk there to remind people about the duck and cover drills that were uh, uh, employed at many of the schools. We go into the Korean War. Uh, we talk about the medical personnel who served in Korea and the naval forces that were there and the veterans who served in the Navy. The Vietnam War, a lot of artifacts, a lot of personal histories there. And we end up uh, with the Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, and the current wars in Afghanistan that are uh, on display there. Uh, this to me has always been a poignant uh, display. Russell Ripito was a graduate of Broomfield High School, and he became a captain, an army ranger, and was killed in Iraq in 2003. And his parents allowed us to uh, display his uniform at the museum and a story about his life. So the real strong personal connections with the community. And on the outside of the building, when you go in uh, through the front door, we have a montage of photos uh, under the legend, where the heroes live on. And that's what we try to do, is make sure that our heroes are never forgotten. So please come and visit us at the museum if you haven't been there for a while. We're even open until three o'clock today, so if you have a chance, that would be great for you to do that. 75 years ago, the most destructive war in human history came to an end, a war that literally changed the course of history. In the histories of World War II, men often play the primary role because they were engaged in combat, but women were relegated, unfortunately, to secondary roles, when in actuality, the Allies could not have won the war without the many contributions and sacrifices of women, both on the home front and on the battlefield. 
In Europe, women faced unbelievable dangers and played major roles in resisting the Nazi aggressor, often at the cost of their own lives. On the home front in the United States, women supported the war effort in many ways. They worked on farms and in factories. They made bandages and bombs. They sewed uniforms and made bullets. They drove trucks and buses and ferried airplanes to the air bases and training centers. They did the jobs that men did before the war called the men away. Today we'll learn about some of these women from two local historians who will give us a view of World War II through women's eyes on both sides of the Atlantic. Our first presenter is Shirley Jamiel, a Broomfield author who loves history and has written over a dozen stories addressing questions that bring to light even more questions when reviewing and trying to understand history. Along with her husband, David, Shirley has been a historical reenactor since 1969 and enjoys teaching, reading, and writing. Today, she will present a dramatic program about a woman I'm sure most of you have never heard of, Genevieve de Gaulle. If the name de Gaulle sounds familiar, she was the niece of Charles de Gaulle, the wartime leader of France in exile, the founder of the Fifth Republic, and the president of France. Not only did Genevieve play an integral part in the French resistance, combating the Nazi agenda in France, but she also supported and aided in healing France and World War II survivors globally after the war ended. While working with the French resistance during World War II, she was arrested by the Gestapo and sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany. She survived and returned to France where she worked tirelessly for the Holocaust victims and the French citizens and became a voice for the voiceless. Shirley has said, I think we can all enjoy and benefit from sharing histories and her stories and learn from each other. One of the things I learned from Genevieve de Gaulle is that we can all make a difference, that it's our privilege and duty to watch out for each other and that our choices can change history. Please welcome Shirley Jamiel. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Genevieve de Gaulle Antonios. Je suis la niece de General Charles de Gaulle. Je suis air être ici aujourd'hui. Oh, pardonnez-moi, parlez-vous français? Non? Oh, c'est dommage. I will speak English. Good morning. My name is Genevieve de Gaulle Antonios. I am the niece to General Charles de Gaulle and I am so happy to be here today. Can I tell you my story? I was born January 25th, 1920. Xavier and Germain de Gaulle. My father met my mother at an afternoon tea. He was 11 years older than her, but he knew from the start they were soulmates. My father was a brilliant man. He loved classical music, painting, and politics. He was a civil engineer, and as much as he loved his young wife and small children, I think he loved his country even more. He expected us to embrace our faith, our family, and our country. My mother, Germaine, was a beautiful, loving woman. She gave birth to me and a year later to my sister Jacqueline, and two years later to my brother Roger. We attended Catholic Church, and we always had our evening prayers. I think fondly of my mother when I see roses. Sadly, her fourth child died in utero, and when the doctors operated to take it out of her womb, she also died. She was only 27. I was four and a half and remember sitting under a magnolia tree in my garden when I was given the news of her death. My grandmother, Jean, came to live with us. She was a brilliant, compassionate, very Christian woman. And Genevieve Guadam 
My mother's mother, who I was named after, also came to live with us. And then there was our nanny, Madeline Stutzman. We did not lack for care. At five, though, I took on the role of being a little mother to my brother and sister. I remember hitting Raja with a comb once because he wasn't taking his studies seriously. And more than once, we would battle with our Greek and our Latin dictionaries. My grandmother, Jean and Henri, had four sons, my father, Xavier, my uncles, Charles, Jacques, and Pierre. My grandfather fought in the French Prussian War in 1870, and each of his sons did their part for our country. Our family thought France was a grand country and was worth defending in times of trouble. After my mother's death, my uncle Charles and his family moved closer to be with us. We spent many holidays together. I remember Charles and my father competing to see who would be the first to wish everyone a happy new year. Uncle Charles always had time to listen. We both loved history, and we were both very serious-minded. Charles married Yvonne, and they had a little girl, Anne, who was diagnosed with Down syndrome. And in 1928, it was common to institutionalize such children, but they decided to keep her in their home and treat her with love and kindness. My father married his cousin, Amir Chevalier Chantapi, when I was 10, and then my sister Jacqueline and I were sent off to a Catholic boarding school. I was considered a reserved, competitive, and high achiever. She was carefree and the life of the party. But as different as we both were, we were very close friends. When I was 12, I remember visiting home and my father giving me a book to read. It was Mein Kampf. Adolf Hitler wrote it while he was in jail. My father was incensed by it. As I read it, I was shocked by its violence and anti-Semitism. My father had taught me that each human being had value, but in this book, I learned if you didn't belong to the Germanic race or the Aryan race, you were nothing. Did I mention that my Uncle Charles, when he was young, was always getting in trouble at school? He said he imagined himself as the king of France, and when he didn't get his way, he would throw a tantrum. He had a teacher that seemed to understand him, though. She told him that if he could learn to control his outburst and really focus on his studies, one day he would be a great leader. I loved my family, especially Charles. He was there when my sister Jacqueline got sick and died. They thought she had gotten ill from contaminated ice cream, but later discovered she had contracted typhoid. She was only 16 when she died October 11, 1938. I asked myself, why did she have to die and not me? Here I am, an old woman, years later, still mourning her death. But now I understand I had a work to do that involved not just my faith and my family, but my country. In May 1940, France was suffering from many battles. It looked like it was defeated. The German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, began bombing Le Havre on May 19 for three days. British troops fired anti-aircraft guns as Nazi planes bombed warehouses, factories, shipyards, and even Le Havre itself. When large numbers of Dutch and Belgian refugees began arriving in France by train, locals panicked and thought that Germany was winning. On June 17, 1940, Prime Minister Marshal Philippe Pénon asked Adolf Hitler for an armistice and said he would do what Hitler wanted in order to avoid war and to save his people any more suffering. This was my world at the age of 20. The public and I felt betrayed. Pétain had lost his courage. He fought in World War I, where 1.4 million Frenchmen were killed and another 4 million were injured. 
but he wanted us to surrender to Hitler. He was a traitor to our country. My father gathered us together to leave the city. I walked with my arm around my grandmother, guarding her as best as I could. She was a frail lady, dressed in black, and I so wanted to protect her and did not want her getting lost in the crowd. We had to walk 40 miles to the city of Lachim to safety. Along the way, Nazis in black uniforms on motorcycles and driving tanks drove by us. We were feeling hopeless and dismayed. As we approached the city, a priest ran toward us from the town square. He was excited because he had just heard a French general speak on BBC radio. He quoted him as saying, we may have lost the battle, but not the war. He said the general's name was de Gaulle. Thrilled by the news, my grandmother broke from the crowd and ran to the priest. Monsieur, monsieur, that's my son. That's my son. He's done what he should have done. As we stood in the square, the Germans arrested my father and took him away. Later, we found out he was sent to Nuremberg. My first act of rebellion against the awful men that took my father away from us was to turn my back to them and not to salute, to salute them as they expected. My Uncle Charles offered himself as an alternative to Patent and called for action. He became the leader of the Free France Movement. My poor grandmother, however, Reliving the horrors of the first war and being in the midst of the new war became sick. She died in my arms. I loved her so. After her death, I returned to university, and with my friends, we tore down Nazi posters and cut them into crosses of Lorraine as a symbol of resistance. I got my friends to insert pictures of my Uncle Charles inside cheap paperbacks to evade Nazi censors and let the citizens of France know what he looked like. The caption said, a champion of the people. The photos were considered illegal. I had them all over the table one evening at my aunt's house, intending to do my share when three French policemen knocked on the door. I quickly let them in and told them that she was with a sick child and took him to another room. I quickly went back to my studies, tore up all the pictures of Uncle Charles and burnt them in the fireplace. When they returned from questioning her, they searched my room and all they could find were ashes. So finding nothing, they left. Eight days later, the Gestapo returned and did another search. They insisted on taking my aunt in for questioning, but she refused to go until she fed all five of her children breakfast. She was gone all day with the soldiers, and that evening she told us she was under house arrest, but continued the resistance activities as much as possible. Others in our group were deported when they were found out. Some were put in prison, and one was shot. I was on a train with important papers trying to get out of the city. I had placed them in a folded up newspaper. And when I heard the train coming to a stop, I quickly put them behind my back. Two soldiers approached me and demanded that I go with them. I left the newspaper on my seat and the woman that was sitting next to me started shouting, you left your papers, you left your papers. Her husband kicked her and told her to be quiet. Luckily, the soldiers didn't notice. I was questioned for one and a half hours, and when they found a picture of my Uncle Charles in my purse, they told me I had broken a law. I argued it was a family picture and would say no more. When they finally released me, I insisted a soldier accompany me back to the train, and there were my papers, to my relief, exactly where I left them. In 1943, it wasn't safe to be a de Gaulle or a resistor. My parents went to Switzerland, so my father couldn't be arrested again. My brother, Roger, put on a British uniform and went to fight. 
and my uncle Pierre was arrested in Paris. Monsieur Bonnet, a corrupt French policeman who worked with the Gestapo, posed as a customer and came to the store where I was working. He demanded that I go with him, holding a machine gun in his hands. When I didn't give him the answers he wanted, he punched me in the jaw. And when I started humming Ode to Joy, he threw me to the ground and put me in a jail cell. I found out the more I was slapped and thrown to the ground, the stronger I became. 958 of us were put on a train and taken to Ravensbrück, a concentration camp surrounded by high voltage powers. It was designed to hold 867, but within five years, it held over 30,000 prisoners. I looked around to see gaunt women with shaved heads who looked so helpless. We were stripped naked, then searched between our legs with toothbrushes and dirty speculums, all the while having the guards laughing at us. After the inspection, we were sent to the showers and given white and blue striped uniforms to wear. We had to sew on triangles on our uniforms to identify ourselves. Political prisoners were red. Social outcast, black. Jehovah Witnesses, purple. Criminals, green. And Jews, yellow. I was numbered 27,372 and taken to block 31 for quarantine and remained there for a few weeks. The sick, and, the sick were given no medical treatment and many died within days. Hitler said he was trying to purify the country. Commander Fritz Serin, who was in charge at Ravensbrück, strove to kill prisoners by underfeeding them and overworking them. He especially seemed to enjoy hangings. I was on many work details. I shoveled dirt and drained marshes to create roads. I loaded coal cars. We were not allowed to look at the guards. If someone dropped a stone or was too slow, they were beaten with leather straps until they bled. One woman was killed by a guard. She, he sliced her carotid artery with a spade that she had dropped. We were to rise at 3.30 a.m. and stand for hours as they did head counts. If someone was missing, they would start all over again. We worked 12-hour days at hard labor and only given coffee, dry bread, and a pathetic cabbage soup for dinner. I was surrounded by exceptionally brave women, however, who set a very good example. When we could, we would talk through the door grates and water pipes. Distorted, disembodied voices came from above and below and from the left and the right, offering personal stories, scriptures, warnings, and advice, faceless but full of heart. If the Germans could be thanked for anything, it was for uniting France behind a common cause that transcended class and political beliefs. We said our rosaries, we recited the eight Beatitudes, and on Christmas Eve, we received a message through the Red Cross from America's First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt. She wrote, I hope that the women of France will find this Christmas less sad because the hour of their deliverance is drawing nearer day by day. We are sending our wishes for a happier new year, and at this season we say to you, courage for the future. The new year will bring you luck. We chose to believe her and take hope rather than believe Hitler's lies that said Germany was winning the war. In our block, we had a small room in which to eat, three toilets, 
bunk beds designed to hold 500 that held over 1,000 women. The filth and lack of personal space was overwhelming, but we did our best to stay strong. That was especially difficult when we were forced to watch the guards do abortions on pregnant women through their eighth month. Newborns were strangled and drowned in front of us until Himmler said that babies had a right to live and the abortions ended. The children that did survive were given meager rations and they looked like gaunt old men. I was in Ravensbrück from the end of January 1944 until Germans finally surrendered May 7th, 1945. It was a long and hard 16 months that seemed like an eternity, one that Dante once described, la chète année speranza vous chanterez. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. What else did I do? One assignment was to take uniforms that they gave us from the Eastern Front and try to clean off the human re remains and lice and blood so that they could be used again. We would spend hours snipping off buttons and finding pieces of material that could be reused. One woman tried to slip off her underwear and wash it with the garments we were working on. The guard caught her and beat her to death in front of us. I was savagely beaten often because I was so slow. Once when I was too tired to work, the women hid me under a large pile of, of rabbit skins so I could rest. Rabbits. The guards would take some of the younger women to be experimented on. They would scrub their legs and then inject them with tetanus, streptococcus bacteria, anything, in order to find a cure. It was so very, very painful. Many died, and those that didn't would hop around, thus the name rabbits. The Red Cross was asked to help, but they wouldn't believe it was happening. So they did nothing. These women continued to limp, and when they got too sick to work, they were sent to be gassed, sometimes 150 at a time, and then their bodies were burnt in the crematoriums. We faced guards who hated us and treated us like vermin on a daily basis. They allowed their dogs to attack us. It was common to beat a woman 25 times and then throw a fallen prisoner into a nearby ditch like garbage. I found out after I was released that Himmler had offered my exchange to Uncle Charles for a German prisoner, but Charles refused, and I was proud of him. As the Germans lost more battles, however, Seren hedged his bets by upgrading my situation. He took me from block 31 to block two, where for a while I had my own straw mattress, blanket, and washcloth. I was put in solitary for a week and thought every day would be my last, that I too was destined for the crematorium, but I wasn't. Shortly after my release, they gave me a clean dress, a shawl, wooden shoes, and even vitamins, and a chance to rest. But even in my confinement, the horrible stench of Ravensbrook could not be denied. They never treated my scurvy or my pleurisy, and my body withered away from starvation and underwork, overwork. When I was finally sent home, I weighed 97 pounds and was almost blind. My father took me in his arms and wept. When the crimes committed at Ravensbrück finally came to trial, they were held in Hamburg, Germany. Only 22 were accused of killing thousands of women there. There were eight judges, 50 observers. 11 of the accused were condemned to death. 
Two were given 15 years prison sentences and two were given 10 year prison sentences because there were not enough witnesses still alive to testify against them. Dr. Erta Oberheiser, who injected the rabbits for surgery, received a 20 year sentence that was reduced to 10 years in 1951 and then released a year later for good behavior? The general indifference of the public hurt us more than many of the atrocities. Our comrades who were dead and no longer with us were entitled to more than that. They were entitled to justice. What became of me after such a horrendous experience? I met and married Bernard Antonios and had four sweet children. My son, Michel, was born April 8, 1947. His brother, Francis Marie, May 7, 1949. My daughter, Isabel, September 19, 1950. And my youngest son, Philippe, December 7, 1953. along with raising my family. I spoke at rallies, spelling out why France should continue to fight for resistance, even in the post-war period. I wrote to the Red Cross, the Vatican, the International Organization for Refugees, and the War Crime Tribunal at Hague to plead for them to help the surviving prisoners. I wrote and did anything I could to educate people about the atrocities of the war and the needs of the post-war survivors. In order for this not to happen again, we must all join together and tell our children these stories because they are the citizens of tomorrow. We need to take a stand to ensure that moral and humanitarian issues should never be separated from political ones and that torturing your enemies was not and is never the answer. At 37, a young mother, I decided there was another war to fight. It broke my heart to read daily reports in the newspaper of the poor in France. One young mother and her baby froze to death on a bus, and I decided there was a war to fight on poverty. I started working with Father Joseph Reninsky, and even got Uncle Charles to donate 6,000 francs to our cause. Our strategy was to equip the poor with the tools to solve their own problems. No kitchens, no handouts. Instead, we found temporary housing and started a center that included rooms for classes in literacy, money management, job skills, and even more. It had a beauty shop and an art studio to rebuild their self-esteem. Why was I allowed to live? I feel my purpose was to become a voice for the voiceless. I refused to accept Nazi oppression, and I refused to accept the hopelessness and poverty of social exclusion of the poor. All were violations of basic human rights. Nothing will guarantee peace. Nothing will save this world if the party of liberation cannot build an order where liberty, security, and the dignity of each person are exalted and guaranteed. Genevieve de Gaulle Antonios spent over 30 years advocating for the poor and testifying in behalf of those who suffered in concentration camps. In her youth, she gave voice to the part of France that wanted to embrace its better self. After the war, she rallied support to help fellow prisoners and shared their stories with the world. In the twilight of her life, she gave everything she had for the rights of the poor. In 1997, Genevieve was the first woman to be awarded the Grand Cross of Legion of Honor. She died on Valentine's Day, 2002, at the age of 84 from Parkinson's disease. She did not want to be remembered as a hero or a saint, but as a woman 
who used the gifts given to her by God to do what was right. In her last writings, she left us this message. Faced with indifference, each generation has a duty of vigilance and resistance. Each individual has the choice to act. Everything starts with a choice, even if you rarely know far in advance where it might lead. Like yesterday in the tragedy of war, when men and women of all opinions, of all backgrounds, and of all ages decided to do something, they did it because they chose to do it. And in turn, we must make choices to meet the challenges of today. Shirley, thank you for that very powerful uh, presentation today. I think we were all very moved by it. Our second presenter today is Colleen Sawyer. She and her husband, Gary Ganyan, have lived in Broomfield for 42 years. Colleen was a reading specialist in School District 12 for over 40 years. She became interested in history after taking several classes at Front Range Community College after she retired. Colleen is well known for her spot-on portrayal of Mamie Dowd Eisenhower of Denver, who, mar who was married to Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe during World War II and the 34th President of the United States. An outgrowth of her Mamie Eisenhower portrayal led to her research and and her reenactments of Mamie and several important women in history. Her love letters from World War II project, part of what she will present today, is based on a love story of her parents who met and fell in love through the mail during the war. Her love letters from World War II won first place in the first annual history conference in 2015 and was presented at the Western Social Sciences Conference in Reno in 2016. She also won second place at the Front Range History Conference for her paper on women spies in World War I. She's also been a previous coffee and conversation speaker at the Broomfield Veterans Museum on several occasions. So please welcome Colleen Sawyer. Thank you. Well, Shirley, mine is not going to be quite as emotional and dramatic, but that was wonderful. Um, I'm going to be talking about the women on the other side of the Atlantic, the women in the United States, and what they were doing for the World War II effort. When the United States entered World War II in 1941, American women stepped up to support the war effort. 350,000 women went overseas to serve in the armed forces, in the Women's Army Corps, the WACs, the women appointed for volunteer emergency services, the WAVES, and the women's branches of the Marines and the Coast Guard. Many women served in Europe as nurses, Red Cross workers, telephone operators, or military intelligence agents. The majority of American women, however, supported the war effort from the home front. Regardless of where they lived, in rural areas or cities, whether they were single, married, housewives, or students, they were all thinking of the security of the country during wartime and supporting the troops who were overseas. With so many women in the, men in the service and so much labor required to meet the military and domestic needs of the country, an unprecedented, an unprecedented phenomenon occurred. Millions of American women were now doing work of which only men had been thought capable. Women worked in factories and comprised 65% of the aviation industry in 1943. 
the country learned that there was nothing in their makeup that made them incapable of performing as well as their male counterparts. The government commissioned artist Norman Rockwell to create a portrait of women factory workers to encourage women to work for the war effort. He created Rosie the Riveter, a symbol of women doing the work the country needed. The Rosies made vehicles, weapons, and war material to be shipped overseas. Women took many jobs that were left open by men serving in the military. They became bus, taxi, trolley, and milk truck drivers, train conductors, filling station attendants, garage mechanics, plumbers, electricians, and switchboard and telephone operators, as well as the more domestic jobs of nursing, teaching, sewing, typing, and bookkeeping. 1,000 women stayed stateside to serve as women's Air Force service pilots, the WASPs. They ferried military planes from the factories to points of departure to the front, many in Sweetwater, Texas. These women had no military background or previous training, but many were skilled in flying as barnstormers, crop dusters, or competing in air races. They learned aviation, mechanics, and map reading in a civilian pilot training program and went on to fly every type of aircraft from B-17s, B-29s, and fighter jets. Several died during their training and from structural failures of the airplanes or sabotage by male pilots who did not want them in the program. They were not acknowledged as military pilots until 1977 when they at last received veteran status by Congress. Women worked for the Red Cross, rolling bandages and collecting medical supplies. They planted victory gardens to supply food for the troops and for the country. They organized blood drives and collected money by selling war bonds, the U.S. Defense Savings Bonds, that funded the government war effort. They volunteered at the local United Service Organization, the USO, by providing entertainment for the soldiers on leave. Women would attend tea dances, serve coffee and cake, and accompany the servicemen to church services, as well as providing magazines, newspapers, and books. The government wanted to conserve the purchase of food items, especially butter and sugar, to use for the troops. So it established food rationing. Women could go to the ration board to request rations for special needs. Because of the shortages, they rationed other items needed for war materials, such as fabric, tires, and nylon. They lived without certain luxuries, such as lipstick, and would even draw eyebrow pencil lines up the back of their legs to simulate nylon stocking seams. Women were in charge of the security of their neighborhoods by organizing blackouts and shelters in case of attack by the enemy. But the most personal and important war effort of American women was writing letters to the servicemen. Millions and millions of letters. World War II affected the American people in profound ways, and the letters sent back and forth across the ocean tell of the challenges of war and separation. Author Tom Brokaw stated that the legacy of letters reveals a new, intensely personal perspective of a momentous time in our history. Letters were the primary connection between people at all levels of society in the 1940s. Even Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, the two leaders of the free world, 
got acquainted and came to admire each other as allies and friends because of their voluminous correspondence during the war. Ordinary Americans, both those who fought and those who stayed on the home front, wrote prolifically about their moving and unforgettable lives. The importance of war correspondence cannot be understated. It was second only to food. The letters boosted morale on the front and at home, communicated every kind of news, and most importantly, strengthened many relationships. War correspondence was a lifeline between soldiers and those left at home. Servicemen wrote to their families, friends, and even strangers. Some of these strangers became friends, and in some cases, closer than friends and many wartime romances blossomed during the war. Some people barely knew each other, but began corresponding, and some who met by chance during the drama of World War II stayed together for the rest of their lives. The war brought together unlikely couples, and letter writing became the chief means of getting acquainted. Couples fell in love, debated, and even argued as the mail continued to flow back and forth. Many couples with very different political and religious views, tastes, and temperaments had the opportunity to share and communicate deeply and learn of each other's feelings, interests, passions, and personalities. When the troops came home, many couples who had never met or only met once would finally see each other after years of wartime correspondence. Letters were a unique form of communication. They revealed personalities, hopes, desires, and views on all aspects of life. A collection of letters reveals the freshest insight into the past, reminding us that what is now history was once real life lived by individuals as full of sensitivities, appetites, passions, and prejudices as we are. Fear of loss, the need to communicate, and a close connection to loved ones heightened the emotional power of letters. Wartime romances adjusted to long distances, kindled new relationships, and fought off the loneliness and boredom of wartime separation. Many romances that took years to develop were sometimes based entirely on letters. One serviceman told interviewer Larry King that his future wife wrote such a warm letter that I rushed to respond, starting a long distance correspondence that would go on for two and a half years before we met. It was love at first sight strengthened by two and a half years of an increasingly loving correspondence. The United States government made the morale of the civilians a priority. Most young women at home were very clear about the purpose of the war. The troops were fighting to save the American way of life. Often the news civilians heard was censored to shield them from distress and keep morale high on the home front. Servicemen focused their letters on winning the war and returning to home life again. They knew the reality of the casualties and the lengthy campaigns, but didn't want to worry their loved ones. Their letters were full of optimism and a determination to come home. Not only did mail sustain morale at home, but it played an essential role in the morale of the American soldier. Written communication from home connected servicemen to their families, friends, sweethearts, and spouses, and boosted morale at camp and in the theaters of war. Life in the service was lonely and fearful and letters brought the hope and optimism they needed to carry out their duty and renew their patriotism. 
the United States Postmaster General explained the importance of mail during wartime by stating, mail from home is a military necessity for there probably is no factor so vital to the morale of a fighting man as frequent letters from home. Soldiers would l later say, letters were the only thing that kept me going. One soldier wrote, please make with the letters and keep up my morale. Your letters are a bright spot in my otherwise dull existence. The United States government encouraged women to write the soldiers by using posters asking, can you pass a mailbox with a clear conscience? Women's lives were difficult on the home front without the companionship of their fathers, sons, brothers, friends, sweethearts, and spouses. Millions of women devoted their time to supporting the troops by writing letters. They would often organize letter writing parties to send countless letters overseas. Many women kept up an extensive correspondence with several young men, sometimes two dozen or more, even those they had never met. One woman told news reporter Studs Terkel, I was writing 10 or 12 letters a week. I'd get four, sometimes five letters a day back. The soldiers themselves sent a tremendous amount of mail back home to family and friends. And when a couple fell in love, the letters increased in frequency. Wartime letters were very long, sometimes 10 pages or more. The sheer volume of mail that was sent during World War II is staggering. In 1945 alone, Americans sent three and a half billion, that's billion, pieces of mail overseas. It is inspiring and commendatory that the military postal system was able to locate so many servicemen scattered throughout the world. World War II may have been the last great age of the love letter. Author Tom Brokaw stated, love letters have been written since, but never on such a scale. But of course, the best love letter of all was the telegram that stated, I'm on my way home. Letters from home recalled details of ordinary and everyday life. These were cherished by the servicemen. Women worried that their trivial events would be boring to the men who were in the middle of battle, danger, and fear. But the soldiers were eager to hear news and gossip of family and neighbors, no matter how mundane. After the war, one GI noted, letters were a big part of our emotional stability because they made us feel like we were still a part of the people back home, that we hadn't been forgotten. Letters from home were filled with feelings of love and worry and loneliness, as well as news of rationing, work, and everyday challenges. The trivial events brought families closer and strengthened the soldiers' reserve, resolve to return quickly to the familiar and comfortable life of home. They were read and reread until the next one arrived. The letters from the front took many forms. They were written on any paper and with any writing instrument available. One woman told interviewer Larry King that her father's letters were not very legible, written mostly in pencil, on any paper he could get his hands on. Often the letters were crumpled and stained. Some were written from the back of a truck over rough terrain. One soldier explained his shaky handwriting by saying, the reason for the wavering is that a damn mine went off not far away and scared me out of a year's growth. Soldiers would write on camp or official army or Red Cross stationery. Many used a lightweight, transparent onion skin paper that was easy to mail. It seems amazing that the servicemen could have written at all under such circumstances, 
let alone that the letters would be delivered to the states. Women on the home front used a variety of personalized stationery that was often scented with perfume and a lipstick imprint, a gesture popular among young women in those war years. They also sent photographs of themselves, sometimes posed in bathing suits, for the GIs to carry or post in their tents. Millions of American servicemen carried these pictures, and some even carried pictures of girls they barely knew, anything to provide a distraction from the war. One soldier asked his pen pal, send me a snap to see if you look as I visualized you. It's been a long time since I met you. I want to renew acquaintance, even if it's with a picture. Later, she sent him several photographs, and he responded, I'm glad you enclosed the snaps of you in a two-piece bathing suit, as the other one, a headshot, did not do you justice at all. Women sent packages to the front with food, 78 RPM records, paperback books, newspapers, handmade items, socks and gloves, candy, and anything that could fit in a box to ship overseas. Some recorded messages on vinyl discs so their loved ones could hear their voices. One of the most important postal services during World War II was Victory Mail, or V-Mail. V-Mail began on June 15, 1942. It used standard 8.5 by 11 stationery and micro, microfilm processing to shrink the letter to 4.5 by 5.5 inches to fit into its own envelope. The process produced lighter, smaller letters and expedited mail service for the armed forces by moving the rapidly expanding volume of wartime mail and reducing the bulk and weight of letters. V-Mail could send 2,500 pounds of paper in just 45 pounds. Between June 15, 1942 and April 1, 1945, more than 556 million V-Mails were sent from both sides of the ocean in addition to the millions of letters sent by airmail in pre-printed blue sheets that folded to make their own envelopes. V-mail reached the soldiers much faster and provided a significant lifeline between the war front and the home front. In 1942, the Postmaster General stated, frequent and rapid communication strengthens fortitude enlivens patriotism, makes loneliness endurable, and inspires to even greater devotion the men who are carrying on our fight. Even though V-Mail ensured added security and speed, it would often take weeks for mail to arrive, yet it was still the most efficient postal delivery in the United States. The War Department urged soldiers and civilians to eliminate sensitive or security information in their letters. Their motto was, loose lips sink ships. Censorship was a safety precaution in the soldiers' letters. Servicemen took care not to reveal any secrets or locations of their missions. Any sensitive material was blacked out or cut out with razor blades or scissors to remove words or passages that might threaten the armed forces' security. One censor recalled, I had an assignment as mail censor for six weeks. I sat and read mail that our GIs were sending home. No letter went through unless someone read it. We had little razor blades to cut out any line that might make reference to a possible invasion. Writer Garson Kanan was delighted to be a censor during the war. He enjoyed reading the letters from the troops and stated that it was a literary experience. He said he read some of the greatest prose in the English language, 
written by 18-year-olds who couldn't spell. It didn't matter. It was the feelings. One soldier wrote to his sweetheart, I know you are disappointed because I don't write you volumes about my experiences, but the reason is because of the censorship regulations. You will have to wait until I get home or else until after the war is over. Even General Dwight Eisenhower, commander of the European theater, was under the restrictions of censorship in his letters to his wife, Mamie. He told her that everything is very secret, even the state of the weather. He was very impatient about the regulations. He stated, I've never written a personal letter that could possibly violate sane censorship. The damn fool censor should know that if I so chose, I could send all my letters to the War Department because I, not the censors, carry the responsibility for the safety of this command. But he continued to send his letters to Mamie through the regular mail channels subject to the censors as he thought of himself as a soldier first. He wrote, I don't keep informed about the censorship regulations, so there is almost nothing I can say. Ike had to keep his invasion plan secret from everyone, even his wife. His son David graduated from West Point on June 6, 1944, the day of the Normandy invasion. In the ultimate self-censorship, Ike wrote a telegram to David saying he could not attend the ceremony because he had previous plans. The women saved each precious letter from their loved ones, but many of the women's letters are lost. When the servicemen got, were deployed to go home, they carried as little as possible and left many letters behind. World War II affected the American people for the rest of their lives. The country was changed by the courage, spirit, sacrifice, and endurance of the men who fought and the women who supported them at home. Letters introduced people, brought them together, and kept them together long after the war was over, even people who would never have found each other. Letters played a crucial role in providing communication and morale for soldiers and civilians and forming bonds of love that lasted the rest of their lives. Millions of love stories came out of World War II, ignited by the letter writing of the women who stayed on the home front. Thank you. Don't go too far. Shirley, can we have you up here? Well, thank you so much uh, today for being here today and those of you who are streaming uh, this uh, performance, and it is a performance because these women are wonderful actresses as well as being fabulous historians. So let's give them another round of applause. And uh, as a token of the Veterans Museum, uh, we'd like to present you, Colleen, with a little, I guess it's a rhinoceros, uh, and to you, uh, Shirley, for your wonderful presentations today. As I said at the beginning of uh, today's activities, if you have the time today, the museum is open until three o'clock and it would be wonderful if you could come by. Uh, otherwise, we're open on Thursdays from 10 till two and all other Saturdays from nine till three. So again, thank you and have a wonderful day. Oh, yes. Um, if we could have the house lights up, uh, in case we have anybody in the audience here who has uh, questions they'd like to address to either of our two uh, ladies, uh, just raise your hand and, uh, and then I will, I will repeat the question. Okay, uh, well, we have our uh, gentleman here with a microphone. Uh, uh, and I see questions Mike. Questions for both of you. Uh, what a 
what attracted you to become a historical reenactor? And secondly, how did you approach the research for both your topics, which were fascinating? Um, normally, I do try to reenact um, after I write a history paper. Um, like I meant, like um, Flint mentioned, I got interested in history from taking history classes at Front Range. Um, but I just think that when it comes from the actual words of the person who was creating the history, that I think it's much more, um, has much more of an impact um, when it's a real person telling her story and not just a textbook account that somebody else um, talked about. So I think reenacting makes it you know, so much more powerful and personal and I think people Real, you know, real ordinary people can relate to these real ordinary people who were creating history. Um, I was 17 when I met my husband. I hated history. I grew up in a, oh, you want me to use this? Okay. I was 17, it's not on, when I met my husband. And I hated history because I was brought up in a school where all we learned was dates and names and places. And I have a horrible memory. He took me to Gettysburg on a date, and we walked around, and he told me the stories of what was going on, and I was just amazed and fell in love. And then we dated some more, and since 1969, we put on costumes, and we go around, and we do history, and every time I learn something more, I just so appreciate what men and women have gone through for us. You might point out your husband. Uh, the I can't see. Oh, over there, that light's blinding me. <laughs> the cute one over there. <laughs> More questions? Other questions? A uh, question for Shirley. Uh, in uh, your presentation, you mentioned uh, the rabbit skins at Ravensbrook. Why were they there? Oh my goodness, I, I knew about the rabbit story, but I found out some more things. The um, Nazi SS soldiers were secretly um, raising rabbits. They started off with 6,500 Angora rabbits, and they ended up with 650,000, go figure. But um, they treated those animals with such kindness. They gave them a specialized diet, they, they spent, time and money building them wonderful cages. They tra treated them like loved ones. And they used the furs to make socks and mittens and line the coats of, of the uniforms. They used the meat to feed the officers. But what struck me about learning about the, the rabbits was how could these soldiers treat animals so kindly the same soldiers treating the women so horribly that they were in charge of at Ravensbrook. It just really made me think. So thank you. I understand that V-mail, uh, this is to Colleen, I understand that V-mail uh, played an important part with your parents. Yes, um, I did not. I didn't include um, the inspiration for my love letters from World War II in this presentation um, because I wanted to talk about women on the home front. But um, the love story is a personal one in our family. My my mom and dad met. Um, uh, they were double dating other people. They met on a double date and. Um, my mother started writing to him, and so for um, almost three years, they had only met once. They started writing letters back and forth. They argued. They, d they were totally different, c t coming from totally different political, religious, even music background. I mean, nothing, nothing in common. And they, they wrote letters back and forth. Over, you know, over a hundred letters that I, we still have my dad's letters. And uh, they fell in love in the mail. So this is a real, it was a real story. And then he came home and they got married and 
here we are. <laughs> so, so um, th this is a real story. I mean, and a, l a lot of people, a lot of people fell in love through the mail who had never met before the war. So the letters were pretty powerful. You know, no email, no, no texting. It was, it was writing letters. <laughs> can, can I add to that, too? I still have letters someplace that my dad would send to my mom, and they were all retracted. I mean, you could barely read them because there was so much censorship. But my in-laws, my husband's parents, met through the mail during the, that time, and they f fell in love and got married and had seven children, and thank goodness, because he wouldn't be here. <laughs> Anyone else uh, have a question or a comment for our presenters today? Okay, I think we're good. Again, thank you for being here, and let's thank Colleen and Shirley. Thank you.